All right, good afternoon. I'm Sally Hubbard, and I'm an antitrust correspondent here at the Capitol Forum. Uh, we're going to change it up a bit here on this panel, and we're going to talk about the disruption that's happening in the media and telecom sectors. And we're also going to ask the question of what kinds of government actions and regulations uh, can help speed up the rate of disruption, and what kinds of government actions may actually impede disruption um, and, and slow its rate. So first, I'm going to ask all, all of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Blair. Hi, I'm Blair Levin, executive director of the Gig.U project, a coalition of about uh, three dozen university communities seeking to accelerate next generation network deployments. Also at the Brookings Institute uh, Metropolitan Policy Project. I'm Barbie Ponder. I'm general counsel and vice president regulatory affairs for Global Star, a mobile satellite services provider. My name is uh, Tim Hanlon. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, an investment advisory and uh, strategic consulting uh, boutique out of Chicago called the Verterra Group, uh, which is uh, an evolution from my previous 20 years in the advertising agency and media agency holding company space. Uh, so uh, probably the token uh, media and advertising and other related uh, pinata for the uh, festivities to come. Hello, I'm Sasha Meinrath, and I've been doing tech telecom work first as founder of the Open Technology Institute. I was also co-founder of something called Measurement Lab, which is now the world's largest open data repository for broadband measurement data. Uh, and right now I'm directing something called XLab which is a group of technologists looking three to five years out for what's coming. So I can't wait for this panel. It should be fun. My name is Jerry Salemi. I'm with uh, Craig McCaw's portfolio companies, uh, Eagle River. We started uh, McCaw Cellular, which became Cellular One, AT&T Wireless, Nextel, and a number of other uh, wireless uh, startups that have actually become real names. All right. So we're going to start off by talking about some of the exciting disruptive projects that are happening uh, in media and telecom. And I want to ask Blair to talk about what he's doing with GigU. Um, thank you. Um, so GigU, uh, well, first of all, let me just say, th this is the first panel on disruption that I've ever been on where I was the only panelist not wearing a tie. And I, I this is, must be a Washington thing. So you may want to discount the level of disruption at this panel <laughs> on that. On that basis, um, uh, I should also note for those people in wa Washington, if you if you think about the importance of issue, Capital Forum has basically said net neutrality is about four times more important than um, disruption. But if we were to do the way Washington works, you would have to sit through about seven weeks of panels on net neutrality to, ha to get to this panel on disruption. The political dialogue about these issues, I'm really grateful you're doing this. Uh, net neutrality is overwhelming in terms of the political capital it takes up, which I think informs um, a lack of attention to these issues. But when we were doing the national broadband plan, what we basic one of the things we saw um, was that for the first time ever, there was no national uh, broadband provider with plans to build a better network than the then best existing network, nor were there any signs that it would ever happen again for a very interesting reason, which is that cable had both the best network and the cheapest upgrade path. And if you study the economics and the game theory, uh, you would basically come to the conclusion that neither cable nor telcos had a incentive to upgrade their networks. It was similar to kind of a prisoner's dilemma in which the two prisoners, if they trust each other not to talk, will both be better off. In this case, if cable and telco trusted each other not to invest, in next generation networks, they would both be better off with a harvest strategy. Um, certainly the behavior was um, uh, indic in indicated they had a high level of trust in each other uh, not, not to make such investments. Um, I'm going to skip over you know, about 399 pages of the 400 page national broadband plan, but simply to say out of those, in the game theory, the way you challenge that is you cause a defection. And one of the things that came out of a bunch of discussions on that issue, uh, which primarily comes to this, we either, in the, in, in the future, we either have cable versus copper or cable versus fiber. In a cable versus fiber world, the incremental cost of bandwidth is basically zero, and therefore innovation grows at whatever pace it should grow at. The disruption, not on the network, but the disruption everywhere else in society comes at a natural pace 
Whereas if you have cable versus copper, there is an incremental cost to bandwidth which uh, basically suppresses innovation and economic growth. Um, uh, in any event, the Google Fiber project arose out of that, and out of that came uh, the Gig.U project, uh, which was kind of premised on the notion that it's not good to have a single company uh, driving that upgrade to fiber, nor is it good to have potential at that point in 2011 only one city. So we organized a bunch of different communities. We have about 25 communities that are now uh, publicly engaged in such projects. There'll be a, uh, an announcement later this week about a Connecticut um, effort that involves a number of different communities. Um, I'm not going to say that any of these things are disruptive as of today. They were designed to be test beds. They were designed to accelerate that moment when, um, whether it be the communities themselves or the telco or the cable company or others are investing, but to basically shake up that prisoner's dilemma that we saw in uh, 2009. And I actually have some optimism that in 2015 and 2016, you'll start to see that. Now, how, how that will play out in healthcare and education, we can chat about, but the, the, the fundamental point is that the game, um, when we started Gig.U, Craig Moffat, who's a very good analyst, said, this will never work because the math doesn't work, uh, and he was exactly right. What he didn't understand was that the mayors had the ability to change the math, and so I would actually argue that the most disruptive agent in the area today in wireline is the mayors who recognize they don't want to be living in a cable versus uh, copper world. They don't want their city in a cable versus copper world. Very interesting. Um, we'll, go, we'll come back to talking about the, what rules can speed this up. Um, but Barbie, could you talk to us about uh, what Global Star is doing that's disruptive Wi-Fi? Sure. Um, I, I'm not sure we're a disruptor in the classic sense, uh, but we, we, you know, if a, if a company trying to, to work hard to use its, spe its spectrum as intensively as possible to provide services to consumers, uh, and uh, which is in all of our sh uh, stakeholders' best interests, is disruptive, then, then I guess we're, we're properly seated on the panel. Uh, Global Star is a mobile satellite services company. We provide voice and data services via satellite to over 600,000 customers around the world. Um, we, we, we are licensed to use a certain spectrum, uh, uh, primarily the 1.6 and 2.4 uh, gigahertz bands. And we use that spectrum every day to save lives and to provide people with connectivity when they have no other option, either because they are in a very remote area of the world uh, operating off the grid or they find themselves uh, in a, uh, a disaster, whether it be a natural disaster or, or um, uh, man-made. So, um, you know, we, we have an interesting opportunity that we've been exploring for quite a while with the FCC, and that is our spectrum at 2.4. Uh, through uh, uh, an accident in history, we were uh, plopped down next to the ISM band, where public Wi-Fi happens at 2.4. Uh, approximately a year ago, the FCC proposed new rules that would permit Global Star to, to utilize its spectrum for what it called low-power mobile broadband services. Uh, of course, we, we've uh, supported those rules. And um, they, you know, the, these, these rules, once adopted, will, have, uh, will significantly increase the amount of spectrum available at 2.4 for mobile broadband services. Um, the opportunity, we refer to it as terrestrial low-power service. And it, you know, it's, a, it's a spectrum game changer for Global Star. We will be able to more efficiently and intensively utilize that spectrum in order to provide what we feel will be a premium uh, service to consumers that are looking for additional uh, mobile broadband options. Of course, you know, we're gonna do this in partnership uh, with companies. Um, we've, we've received very positive comments uh, in the proceeding from, from some major industry players, uh, Cisco, Samsung, Sprint, Dish, Ruckus Wireless, uh, all are either expressing no objection to, to being in full out support for, for what we're proposing. Um, the, the, the rules that the FCC has proposed, they are consistent with the National Broadband Plan, uh, which was to basically free up additional satellite spectrum for mobile broadband purposes. Uh, it was consistent with the recommendations that were issued uh, almost five years ago now. Um, it, it's also consistent with uh, FCC's overall spectrum policy 
uh, which I, I think I, I always sum it up is that the highest and best use for any spectrum is for terrestrial mobile broadband purposes, and the FCC is, is uh, doing what it can in, a, in, a, in quite a few different proceedings uh, to free up as much as possible. Um, you know, Cisco, uh, uh, who did file comments in our proceedings, said, you know, the FCC is simply unable to free up spectrum fast enough to meet uh, the growing needs of, of consumers for, for mobile data services. And uh, we agree with that. And we do believe that, that uh, the FCC should take an all of the above approach. It, take a, it took a huge first, uh, uh, a next step uh, earlier this year in the five gigahertz proceeding, which we were certainly involved in and freed up an additional 100 megahertz at uh, 5.1. There's more work to be done there by the FCC, which we fully support. And, uh, but, but in an all of the above approach, the FCC should also move forward with uh, mid-band spectrum at 2.4 and uh, adopt the rules that it proposed uh, approximately a year ago. There's two unique aspects about terrestrial low power service that I want to point out before I hand it back over. One of them is that the first is that it's, it's not a US only opportunity. Uh, this is an international opportunity. The 2.4 uh, gigahertz ISM band is globally harmonized, just as Global Star Spectrum uh, is right next to it. So, so once the FCC does act, uh, we do intend to basically take the show on the road um, and um, uh, uh, seek uh, uh, regulatory authority uh, internationally uh, so that we can provide this globally harmonized uh, uh, service. Uh, the other interesting aspect of it is that you know, this is, there's an existing ecosystem of devices out there that are um, engineered to operate on this additional band. They're just restricted from doing so currently. Um, so, so it, it, you know, unlike everything else going on at the FCC, this is truly an immediate solution. So um, I'll just wrap up by saying that the, you know, the commissioners, uh, they can actually vote to make something happen in our proceeding, and they will still be commissioners when consumers are seeing the benefits of, of, of what they did. Thanks. All right, so we've talked about some uh, disruption in, in broadband and uh, Wi-Fi, and I wanted to talk to uh, have Tim talk a little bit about what's happening in the media space, and uh, much like the demand for, you know, more uh, wi wireless spectrum, a lot of the changes that are happening in the media space are being kind of demanded by consumers, consumers changing habits and. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll be the Molotov cocktail in all this. Um, uh, I come at this from more of a, um, a programmer and consumer and even marketer uh, perspective, having spent about two decades in uh, the world of advertising and media agencies uh, and creating, having created two ventures practices in two of the big holding companies in that space, companies like Publicis Group and Interpublic. Um, one of our first exits in our ventures practice was a little company called Sling Media, which seven, eight years ago had this sort of notion about being able to authenticate, even before the word made any uh, sense to anybody on, the, on, the, on Main Street, one's subscription of, uh, of television services wherever you might be, courtesy of broadband connection, right? And Dish Network obviously bought them out. But other companies like Navic Networks were in our investment portfolio, which to those uh, astute followers of the Aereo Supreme Court case, no was Chet Kenosha's previous company before launching Aereo. Um, so a whole long history of working with early stage firms uh, big marketing and, and media companies all basically trying to figure each other out. Um, and it's messy. Um, it continues to be messy. Um, it continues to be exciting. Um, and uh, as Sally knows from last week, I dragged her up to New York uh, along with Hal Singer, who was on the previous panel, uh, for a similar conversation in front of uh, a group of uh, practitioners in the future of television space. Um, so I'll start with that one. I mean, whatever, I, I call it the medium formerly known as television. Um, we call it, uh, you know, video is a, is a convenient term. Um, I think it's a very all-encompassing term, and I see um, uh, almost an unfettered explosion of innovation around that. Um, the problem with a bunch of it, uh, whether it's the new definition of what a, an MVPD or maybe better termed OVP might look like, um, we know some of the uh, players that may step up into that, that space, or at least are signaling that. Um, there are probably a whole host of others, but a lot of that is dependent. Right? So dependent on a whole bunch of conversations that we've already had today and will still have yet today. Um, the regulatory environments, the, uh, the ability for a broadband uh, uh, connection to enable without uh, um, impeding uh, pure content from an alternate source that's not an incumbent uh, provider of services. Um, I even look at things like Aereo, even though the Supreme Court in its 
supposed wisdom and its very, very narrow characterization of the case and upending what seemed to be a fairly steady drumbeat of lower court decisions um, uh, and focus, focusing specifically on copyright, I, I think it is just the beginning of a whole host of um, uh, broadcast uh, into digital kinds of um, uh, delivery environments. Um, it did not and still has not yet redefined or defined the modern version of what broadcasting is, which when last I checked was a free over the air service available, should be available to everyone uh, through uh, government spectrum and license. Um, and I see uh, lots of different uh, innovation around um, uh, the, the measurement of television and video, uh, which marketers and advertisers uh, uh, greatly depend on. As a matter of fact, Timely is today's headlines. I'll throw out a new company that I didn't know existed until about two hours ago called Newcoin, N-E-W-C-O-I-N. Newcoin is a, 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 a new firm that was announced today by Tribune, Fox TV stations, and Univision to create a challenger to local television and, and video across devices measurement uh, to what Nielsen has historically done or not done in that measurement space and what a company called RentTrack has been trying to do a little bit with set-top box data measurement. So in other words, all encompassed, the future of television and video, uh, the future of how that is delivered to consumers, how that's measured. Frankly, we see every day consumers already registering their, uh, I don't know if it's the word is disdain, uh, but it is, uh, they are registering their um, either dissatisfaction or um, uh, non-mandatoriness, I guess, for taking television in its current multi-channel bundles and the pricing associated with. Um, we call it, at the Vertera Group, we call it good enough TV. Uh, there is a younger audience uh, profile out there, uh, college kids, maybe just after college as well, and certainly those uh, younger than them who are already making trade-offs themselves as to what constitutes, quote-unquote, good enough video and television. Um, and I can tell you that I don't know if it's a la carte, right? Uh, I do know it's probably more unbundled. And all of that is exciting to people in the marketing uh, and media spaces. Uh, if you're, the more incumbent you are in terms of today's business model, the more scary that is. Um, but we see that uh, day in and day out. And I can, I'll throw in some specific companies in a second, but um, uh, that's, to me, that's, you take the word broadband and you kind of broaden it literally uh, to uh, encompass things like media and television and video. Uh, it becomes even much more exciting than some of the things we've been talking about already today. Well, it's interesting because all of these topics, like we've talked about this before, are they seem like they're silos, telecom, I mean, broadband, uh, wire, wireless, media, but they're all interdependent, and what regulations are passed in one area will affect every other area. So what happens with, uh, with, with, with net neutrality will affect the delivery of, of the, the new, you know, the new form of TV. Um, so everything is interdependent. And Sasha, I know you had some ideas about other kind of government uh, steps that could be taken to, easy steps that could be taken to really promote some more of this disruption. I would kind of like to start moving into that now. Or did you have other areas of disruption that you wanted to talk about first? Well, I'm just thinking if you're, if you're talking about easy technologically versus easy politically, because most of the problems actually easy are well-known technical no problems with well-known solutions. Right, right, right. But then you have to navigate, you know, DC, and that's where it gets really complicated. My own work, uh, 15 years ago, I had uh, a number of underemployed super geek friends and we started building something that grew into kind of a massive open source distributed communication system called Commotion Wireless. And I got into DC regulatory reform efforts in 2004, having realized that all of the work we were doing deploying low cost communications in our community was gonna get stymied because our regulatory policies, our DC political structures were like ancient in terms of their conceptualization of tech. And perhaps no place is this more obvious than in spectrum policy, where the notion of computers and digital technology is almost foreign to how we allocate and assign frequencies. And DC has consistently killed a number of different innovations in this space. Interference temperature, right? This is the idea that you can 
broadcast below the noise floor. It's the equivalent of you whispering to your neighbor in this room while I'm talking to you. Both of those communications can happen at the same time. The FCC says, we don't know, we don't have enough information. I've been working on something called television white space, which is one of these areas where if you've ever flipped through a TV, you know that there's a lot of channels that aren't used. If you've ever flipped through the channels on your car's radio, you know that there's a lot of channels that aren't used. This is actually the case everywhere. Uh, according to the best available estimates, most of the country utilizes spectrum at rates that are under 10 percent, under 10 percent. And in places like Washington, D.C., it might get as high as about 20 percent. Well, now think about any resource that we would be using at 10 to 20 percent efficiency and simultaneously declaring is all tapped out, and you have spectrum today. And what this means to all of you is that you pay far more than you need to for far worse service in far fewer places because there's this artificial scarcity built into the business models and the technologies themselves. So for my work, you know, I do a lot on software-defined radios, cognitive radios. In essence, radios that utilize this crazy digital technology, these computers that have been developed over the last 50 plus years to make more efficient use of a resource that is theoretically the public's airwaves. And in so doing, what we have found and proofed out is that we can drop the cost of all communications, video, text messaging, voice, et cetera, by at least 90%. And when you think about a goal, which is what we have, a free, safe, ubiquitous connectivity for everyone on the planet, the only way you get to that four to five billion people, the majority of people who aren't yet meaningfully online, is through different business models and use of these kinds of distributed technologies. And so all of a sudden you start seeing how commotion, the technology that we've been developing, spectrum reform, telecommunications reform, a lot of these innovations that are happening are both incredibly useful, but also hyper disruptive to incumbents that are making huge amounts of money extracted from all of your wallets and pocketbooks over a model that is horrendously inefficient and yet protected by Washington, D.C. All right. Well, um, l let's see if Jerry, Jerry, did you have anything to add to the, dis to the idea of what kind of disruption is happening before we start talking about the different rules? Yeah, despite my tie that Blair has <laughs> criticized, and it's my best tie, by the way, I, I thought I'd take a little bit different approach because I'm not sure disruption is really what everyone thinks it is. It isn't always necessarily something that is developed by a new innovation. There are really great innovations that are developed. Technology moves something along, and you have a di disruption that happens in the marketplace that truly is transformational and is truly good. Talked about the internet earlier. If 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 Sasha can make his um, uh, his uh, radios work, that'd be great. That'd be truly that would be truly disruptive. Ninety percent of the spectrum being better utilized at the cost that it currently is would really change the way we do business, and that would be great. But most of the cases of disruption in the marketplace and telecommunications and elsewhere have been really either regulatory arbitrage, or they have been in many cases, rule changes that first entrants have by getting an FCC rule change, or they've been an, an amalgam of the both of them, and they have a short-term kind of fleeting change that really does move the incumbents, gets the incumbents off their butt, really good positive things. So, so when Blair and Google bring you know fiber and, and gig to the home, that changes those markets and it really does a good thing and it really does drive. And we can give a number of examples of that. When COVAD and North Point decided to provide DSL in, in basically in competition to the Bell companies, that really changed the market. All of a sudden, Bell companies, after holding this technology for 20 years decide that they have to provide DSL services. So those, those companies take an idea and move it forward in the marketplace. Now, North Point is part of AT&T now because I think they were bought by SBC, which was bought by, which was bought by, which was bought by, and, and COVAD, you know, to totally doesn't exist. And I could go through a litany of companies that basically tried to come in and at a moment in time were disruptive. I mean, we can look at 
CompuServe, Prodigy, Earthlink, and AOL all at the same time, giving you a, a disk at every supermarket so you can download um, you know, you know, services, but ISP services are, we can go back to Raven Stadium and look at the PSI net purple sign on the top of Raven Stadium from when those ISPs were booming. But in most of those cases, they were fleeting. They have a short temporary change in the marketplace. Positive for consumers, but not necessarily something that is going to continue to be dramatic. So I'm, I'm going to name one other company because Sasha reminded me of it. It's called North Point Technology, separate from North Point, which was the DSL provider. And they actually applied to the FCC to say that, you know, you have these satellites that are distributing DBS services, satellite broadcast services down, and I can use that same spectrum to provide a, a separate service using the same spectrum. And the incumbent didn't allow that to happen. That never got approved. It was an idea that could have actually helped. So I think all I want to talk about, in a sense, is what are we really trying to do? How do we really disrupt the market, and how do we make it so that it's long term and it doesn't just become fodder for the, for the incumbent to basically reinforce their incumbent position, which is really what, if you look at most of the things, UUNet, which I thought was true disruptor. I mean, it's, it's part of MCI, which is part of, you know, Verizon, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's really, it's hard to get something to stick. But I think one, some of the things that Sasha said and some of the things that Blair said have the elements of being truly disruptive. Because there is a, a, a part of the spectrum, the wireless unlicensed spectrum, which really is not utilized correctly and has a chance to really do a lot. And, and I think that the white spaces is part of that. But you have a lot of wireless services that are going to be able to compete against incumbents using voice over Wi-Fi, Volte, voice over LTE, broadband services that are really going to change the way they get delivered. There's a lot that's going to be done around sensors and beacons that are going to really change the way we all communicate. The way you enter a room in which, you know, privacy, privacy be damned, and because and, it's going to happen anyway, probably. And Ed Markey, who was my only mentor in life, is probably you know going to scream that I would ever say that privacy be damned. But but you know you have these you're going to walk in the room, and your phone is going to actually identify every beacon, every other phone that's in this room, catalog that, send it through the internet to a database, and they're all going to be measured. So it's going to know what what are the signals in here? What are the what are the cameras that they're using to basically monitor this room? What other devices? Who else are we connected to? I was in a room the other day with someone who basically had you know you walked in. He picked up that my Facebook was open as I walked in the room on my phone without telling me. Just like it just it, it just doesn't tell you that this happens. I walk in, my Facebook is open. He downloads all the names on my Facebook because he had access to my account, because I had not turned it off, had not signed out on Facebook. And those are the things that are really going to change. Those are going to be disruptive. And the question is, can we harness them? Can we harness them for the betterment of the consumers? Can we harness them for the betterment of the public? And can we also make money on it? Because part of you know, some of the ideas that Sasha has that are great, they've been there for a long time. The question is, how do you build a business model around them to make them work? And that's it. So, so one thing I wanted to get, get back to is, you know, Sasha's point that he's talking about true disruption, but true disruption is always going to be threatening to the incumbents, right? So what types of government actions can try to level the playing, can help level the playing field for true innovation and kind of weaken some of the grip of the uh, incumbents' political power in D.C.? I mean, certainly mergers that we're looking at are only going to solidify any... Uh, or increase the power of the incumbents. So I would, that's what I would like to get your views on. Sasha, sounds like you have yeah, something I mean, to say. Technological innovations are happening. And I would argue they're pretty inevitable at this point in time. There's not much we can do to stop innovation writ large. And what that creates then is ever increasing pressure. The question before us is not whether we're going to change. It's whether that's going to be a graceful glide path or one that is disruptive because it's happening very quickly in an uncontrolled manner. Now, the reason why I've spent, I guess now, 10 years working inside the belly of the beast while developing technologies that are creating crises is because I would much rather this, this transition be graceful. I'd much rather get ahead of 
the technology. Now, is that possible? And is that possible in today's day and age here in Washington, D.C.? I think is really a much bigger question. I mean, I've been pushing now for several years to just do a spectrum audit, right? And I worked with Kerry's office uh, when he was still in, in the Senate to draft legislation that would say, like, let's just figure out what's in use and how often it's being used and where it's in use. Because we have l all these claims, right? I remember, Blair, rem a number of us probably remember, we were told explicitly on numerous occasions in testimony that if we didn't create new massive bands for cellular phones, that the system was going to be like, would implode by 2015. So we got like weeks. 14 <laughs> days and then cellular is going to implode according to those statements. Now, I viewed, I viewed it at the time as ridiculous. I continue to view it as ridiculous. On January 1st, I will know it was ridiculous. But the point here is that without empirical information, we cannot make informed decisions. And that goes for broadband measurement, that goes for spectrum utilization, that goes for so many different areas. And yet, I feel like we are living through this era where we adamantly refuse to collect or make public the information that would actually lead to better decision making. Well, you, you, you will find that no more, uh, no more pronounced than in places, let's say, ooh, I don't know, like the NAB, okay? So um, instead of, uh, uh, yeah, it, the NAB did a uh, exquisite job of uh, hiring the best lawyers to uh, litigate, to narrowly define, and ultimately win uh, the, the, the decision uh, inevitably against um, Aereo. They are doing a yeoman's-like uh, battle plan against uh, anything hinting of a more rational uh, retrans uh, schema uh, that, you know, I, again, as, as an example, right, the whole DISH network, CBS stations, uh, fracas a couple of uh, two weeks ago, the latest of in a la long series of, of skirmishes, right? If you listen to the radio ads from Jim Nance and Vern Lundquist lustily uh, uh, worrying that you're not going to be able to watch a, a crucial football game this weekend uh, if you're a Dish Network subscriber, um, you know, call Dish Network and or find another provider and get what you paid for, right? A TV station from CBS. Get what you paid for. Get what you paid for. When last I checked, it was the CBS television signal was a free, over-the-air service available to any American with a receiver or an antenna or whatever definition of an antenna is. And arguably has been a 20-year-plus play out of a rule change circa mid-1990s that effectively has been, shall I say, bent, stretched, uh, misinterpreted and to the f huge financial gain of the broadcast station groups. And I, I think fundamentally, right, so the, the issues of innovation, right, and Aereo, again, uh, the copyright issue clearly is, is real, but it's not the end of other broadcast plus antenna plus digitally delivered of signal for maybe for those folks who can't get an over-the-air signal from a, from a facing antenna. Um, these, the technology, with all due respect, tends not to be the problem. It tends to be the either incumbents or the, 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 the legal issues or rules at that time uh, that, that seem to be sort of behind, behind the eight ball. I mean, there's no television programmer out there, broadcasters included, who does not want to see anytime soon a change to the, uh, the bundle that cable and satellite and telco TV providers provide, right? Because there's an inefficiency in the television industry that's baked in, right? Advertisers know this when they go to buy advertising. You can't buy just the only the spots and the shows that you want. You gotta get the crap that the networks are also selling that people aren't watching too. It's just the way it is. And the same thing with programming, right? You, you want just ESPN? Well, great, you can't because you also have to get ESPN Classic and all these other Disney channels that you've never heard of. And Viacom's a master of that game. So what, I, what I'm getting at is that consumers are already ahead Right? And I think you're kind of alluding to some of this. Consumers are already ahead of where we here in Washington might be, and frankly, a bunch of the business models and the incumbents who want to fight and, le and le uh, go at it in court right, uh, before innovating. Right? So I, I, I agree with you that it should be a more uh, opportunistic uh, scenario for, for innovation to happen, but um, 
there's a lot of, when pe people's livelihoods are at stake, uh, they'd rather fight than switch. And having been in the, in, the, in the trenches for a good 10, 15, 20 years around technology and big media companies and big marketers, um, there's innovation to a point. And it's only to a point where it benefits me or uh, if it's too uncertain, I don't want to hear about it. And that, that's, unfortunately, that's very frustrating. We think Congress is frustrating. That reality is very frustrating. But I think long term, however long you want to play the game, I think it's kind of like the stock market. If you want to play the short game, right, you want to get in and get out of the market, then less Moonves and CBS and that sort of approach to television and that indus the industry, that's pr he's probably the guy to bet, it, bet on. Right? But if you bet on the longer term issues, that spectrum is a limited, uh, uh, scarce resource, that there are other next generation services to come, that maybe having 12 TV stations in a marketplace might be a little too much and maybe an inefficient use of that bandwidth versus all the technological things that could be done with two stations worth of that bandwidth. Um, then you're probably playing a bit of a mid to longer term game. And I think that's what policy is really kind of all about. And I've heard some of the, and I'll wrap this up. I heard earlier today a lot of people sort of going back and forth on, you know, being wary of sort of making policy decisions off of, you know, uh, events like uh, mergers and the, and the like. I, you know, things are moving so fast that I, I don't know if there's going to even be any golden opportunity when it becomes so obvious that a policy can be made after the fact, right? I think there has to be some incremental policy decision making in the process of some of these deals and some of these relationships, right? Comcast Time Warner, as was said earlier by somebody, prescient, there's no going back once that's, if and when that's done, right? And it's gonna be a tougher claw, and I don't know if, if something like a gig, yeah. gig that you right, can that's catch up. I wanted right? to ask Blair, um, since you know, you're taking on this tremendous challenge of creating a fiber uh, competitor, what types of rulemakings or what type of action would the, would the government's uh, handling of the Comcast Time Warner cable merger affect your ability to do that? Would the I'm Title II? Actually, I'm, clear. I'm, I'm not creating a fiber competitor. I'm, I'm not really doing that much of anything. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, for example, in North Carolina, we were the first ones to negotiate with uh, AT&T, so the giga, first gigapower project. I mean, you know, th th this does raise the question that Sasha raised. Are you trying to really disrupt, or are you trying to have a general glide path? It is my view coming out of the plan that the primary purpose of the FCC at this moment in time was to assure that innovation, uh, that, that bandwidth would never be a constraint to innovation and economic growth, social progress. And so I'm kind of indifferent as to who provides it. You know, if you can cut the price by 90%, that's great. If you can increase it by basically 50 times, which is what Google and some of the gig.u projects are doing, that's good too. So when we were looking at it, there are two big constraints. One is spectrum, the other is fiber. I, what, I, what I really mean is mobility and, um, well, actually, I do really mean kind of in the air and in a pipe. As to spectrum, we could chat about a lot of things. Sasha and I agree on a lot. We also disagree on a lot. But I would just note that there have been a number of things, and, and the Global Star would be an example where the FCC has finally taken the position, whatever the rules were then, we should change the rules to make sure that spectrum moves to use. The worst use of spectrum is no use. And the interesting thing is, right now, there are companies that have paid $44 billion for spectrum that the CBO thought would raise zero, and that a significant portion of which was almost given away for free. So there is actually intelligence to be done. I mean, Sasha may be right about that there's no spectrum crunch, but I'm just saying that there are some people betting um, uh, differently. Now, having said that, when that auction is over and when we see who actually bought it, I think there'll be a whole new round of debate, which will be very interesting, as to uh, the next auction, which will be the 600 megahertz or incentive auction, which has a number of complexities, but is really an interesting effort to try to change how we, over time, uh, allocate spectrum. As, as to the fiber thing, I would simply tell you, um, again, uh, what were the constraints that meant that cable and telco were not going to invest in next generation networks. And it turns out it's always about access to inputs. And so how do you change uh, the economics of the access to inputs? These inputs include poles, uh, programming, uh, set-top boxes, um, MDUs, uh, and customers. There probably are other ones, but those are the big ones. Um, there's, there's, there's a number of things, by the way, that cities do that can lower the cost of deployment 
in terms of how they do construction permitting and regulation, which Google has done, I think, a tremendous job, and AT&T would agree, uh, with kind of sensitizing cities to how they, as kind of the monopolist regulator of construction, add to the difficulty of providing bandwidth. But the topics that I've just raised are all, I think, essentially raised in the context of both mergers and in terms of certain policies. And Tom Wheeler, in his speech uh, in early September, talked about the importance of having kind of this upgrade since 85% of the country, if you define the market as 25 megs and Bub only has one choice, he's going to end up having to look at the access to these various inputs. Um, and whether or not the rules should be changed as to any of these things we could debate, but I think those, those are the kind of the buckets where if you want more deployment, you're gonna to have to look uh, to change the math. Okay, I wanted to open up the conversation to uh, the audience. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? Jerry, I, I, we've had a conversation uh, recently about sort of how you think things will play out uh, with if they do Title II versus if they don't do Title II on net neutrality. I mean, in terms of innovation, I mean, this seems to be one of the central uh, questions. How is, how is this rule, um, uh, if they, you know, do these two options, what's, what's, the, what's the future of innovation and disruption going to be like? How do you guys see that playing out? And if you want to include uh, the mergers as well into that conversation, you know, sort of a spectrum of really aggressive uh, action on competition on the one side versus letting the mergers go through and not doing much on title, net neutrality. I, I'm gonna let Sasha answer most of that question because I, he was, he was, I could feel him on my arm going, <laughs> you know, grabbing it. So, so I'm gonna let him do a lot of that. And, and I'm gonna jump out a little bit on, on what Blair said and what Sasha said earlier about Spectrum and try to get to a couple of those issues. Because if you really look at what has just happened in this most recent auction, one of the one of the investors um, analysts that that Blair actually mentioned said that the the incumbents, if they paid the, as much money as he believes they paid, are going to have a hard time paying a dividend because the cost for a delivered bit of wireless is going to be so great that it's hard to think that they can be economic, and that if you look at this as only the precursor for the next potentially bigger auction, the price of Spectrum is going to only ensure that you can't have more competition come into the marketplace because you actually have these incumbents pushing the price up, paying a monopoly rent that prevents a new entrant. And one of the things that's a regulatory policy that I opposed, so let me just get that on the line, was an old regulatory policy when the first 200 megahertz of spectrum was made available by Congress and released in 93. And there was a PCS, the first PCS auction, and what they did is they said the incumbent could not get more spectrum. They could only get 10 megahertz instead of a 30 megahertz license in a market that they already had. And it actually did spawn three new competitors in that marketplace at that time. And that is the type of very aggressive policy. That policy was incredibly controversial it was at the brilliant. time. That really it was can totally brilliant. Pardon me? Though I, I just, as an historical note, would note that I think that the head of the trade association, the wireless industry, opposed it. I, 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 as did I. So I mean, listen, we all have religion late in life, and it's uh, it's great to be old. Um, so so that's it. I, so I do think there are things like that. There are really in, in regulatory changes. You know, uh, you know, if you really look at a lot of what's happening, they really were based on regulatory changes. It's just that often it's the first person who actually starts. It's like Global Star may not get the change they need by the time it's it's helps Global Star. But that type of change is going to be made, and it's going to be helpful. It's just that you know you, we have such a, ch a lag in getting these things done. And now you can talk about Title II because I promised my wife I wouldn't. <laughs> Jerry, do you know something I don't? <laughs> oh no, 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 no! I wasn't saying no. I just went historically. The history of Title II is fascinating to me, right? AT and T existed for decades under Title II. Uh, and seems to have done all right for itself. Uh, and people forget that the early internet was all under Title II. When you had your dial-up modems, the reason why we had thousands of internet service providers in the United States is because of common carriage and because of the rules under Title II. So when they carved out this information service from Title II, 
and have now gone through an unprecedented modern history of kerfuffles and giant regulatory legalistic contortions to try to figure out what the structure is. One of the reasons why I say, well, why don't you just put it back under Title II is because that's what worked before, that's what worked for the early internet. And I am certain that if we took just one-tenth of the energy that we are spending here in arguing of where this telecommunication service should be and actually figuring out what to forbear and how it should fit under where it came from, that we could call this done and move on to something much more exciting. Now that is, of course, anathema in DC. I'll add one last thing that is also anathema in DC, which is what is the function of an auction? And who really pays for that? Because to me, it's a, it's a two-step tax, right? These incumbents in a non-competitive market pay a lot of money. And then all of you, as the captured clients and customers of these incumbents, will pay higher prices in order to get this money back. And so the reason why I've been very pro large ecosystem of different regulatory processes. The reason why I've been pushing for an unlicensed GSM, an unlicensed cellular band, is because I think the function of the SEC should actually be to deliver the best possible services to all of us. And the incumbents have already demonstrated their ability to utilize unlicensed, to offload from for fee services to unlicensed Wi-Fi. And why shouldn't we be able to do that with telecommunications writ large. Imagine if every small, medium-sized business could offload every text message and every phone call in their home office to a free service. But this is outside of the narrow parameters of what's acceptable use or allocation and assignment of spectrum today in DC. And until we open up our thinking, we're all going to end up literally paying for these mistakes. Sasha. Can I just uh, okay. offer a, an historical footnote? But let me just say that I, I, I certainly agree with Sasha that there ought to be a balanced portfolio of unlicensed and, and sharing and exclusive. And well, Sasha may not agree with the exclusive. Uh, and I should note that for by way of disclosure, I'm uh, an investor and a, an advisor to a company called Bandwidth.com, which has uh, the first um, Wi-Fi based uh, service um, called Republic Wireless. Uh, I'm not sure. Re re Republic's a very interesting company to me. I'm not sure it's as interesting to you. I would simply say that Wi-Fi offloading is a very big deal and will provide a mechanism for, I think, disruption uh, in 15 and 16 beyond which we see today. But it's a very important um, technology development. I would just note that in April of 1994, about two months before the first auctions, Forbes magazine ran a cover story with George Gilder, the great futurist, um, and very conservative thinker saying, stop the auctions. And uh, Chairman Hunt and I thought this was rather odd since it actually was a conservative, you know, mantra for ever since Coase proposed it in the 50s that we ought, to we ought to allocate spectrum by auctions. And what he was fundamentally saying was um, dynamic sharing is a much way to, better way to do it. And I think, I think actually, I, I, I don't know if you remember the article, but something that, that you said, and, and our view was, well, you know, if Gilder's right, no one will pay anything for the auction. No one will pay anything for the spectrum. Um, uh, the, the, the technology he was talking about, I think, um, has been 10 years, in, ever since April of 94, it has been just 10 years away, and it continues to be about 10 years away. And so I, I tell that story not to say that we did the right thing, though I think we did, but rather to suggest, at the end of the day, the government has to make decisions on the best available information that it has. Sometimes it makes the right ones, sometimes it makes the wrong ones. It could have been that Gilder could have been proved right in 95, but he wasn't. And if you compare the prices and functions of cellular service in April of 94 with what you have today, uh, obviously there's been, e even though it was done with exclusive entities, and you can call it an oligarch, there's been a tremendous increase in the value proposition for consumers uh, of that. But I, I don't doubt that eventually there will be those kinds of technology breakthroughs 
that, and we better make sure that we have enough spectrum available so that that balanced portfolio can allow the spectrum to be used in the, in the way that really assumes, uh, serves the economic uh, development. One, one last point, maybe, um, and I just want to bring it sort of outside the Beltway, um, even though I went to undergrad here, um, I, I escaped. Um, uh, I think it's really important to understand, so the, the whole conversation is around disruption and disruptors. I think the ultimate disruptor really is the, the consumer, the individual, people who live in this country. Um, and they're already starting to, courtesy of technology and, and their own unique and individual workarounds, figure out better solutions for themselves, right, which are outside of our legal discussions, which are outside of business conventions. And a lot of it tends to be around a desire to do things better, faster, cheaper, unencumbered, without any violation of privacy, et cetera, right? The DVR, right, when replay TV and TiVo came along is really a response to consumers not wanting to watch commercials because there were too many commercials in, in television, and that is starting to play itself out. People don't want to pay $150 to $200 for television service in their homes. And if you go, and as you travel around, just ask anybody who is in love with their cable service provider or their DBS provider. They're not. Right? And their kids are not. Their kids don't even know what quote unquote television is. Okay? So when you think about broadband, when you think about spectrum, when you think about broadcasting, you think about auctions, you think about all that stuff, uh, ask yourself, and frankly, if you're a government representative or uh, somebody who uh, uh, answers to a constituency, ask. Uh, uh, frankly, those are the folks that should be informing this conversation and this debate. Because consumers are already a way ahead of where all of you in this room think that they are. And they're already starting to register by unplugging their broadband connection, uh, not unplugging, plugging in their broadband connections and ditching their television services where they can, or looking to subscribe only to channels that they want to get access to, maybe hastened by this new breed of OVP. Um, but again, all the things that we talk about here, the broadband uh, policies and, and uh, all of the various technical uh, uh, demarcations and, and policy issues, are, are really, I think, the seeds of the answers, the proper answers to those things, are already out there in the consumer marketplace. And that's my only admonition. If you want to think about the cool things that still can be done and the disruption that lays, lies ahead, consumers can already tell you, especially younger ones, about what's a more realistic scenario for them and their consumption habits than any policy wonk in, 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 in D.C. So. So I think we're almost out of time. We've got a question there in the audience. I'll take that. Just uh, related to the last comment, one thing that really hasn't been discussed at all today is one of the biggest forms of disruption going on right now is the traditional content companies disrupting not only the traditional cable TV ecosystem, but in my view, in a lot of people's views, they're trading dollars for pennies going to places like Netflix. And it's taken a while, but we're now starting to see in TV ratings you know, traditional TV ratings are going through the floor, and the companies that have the most content on these um, over-the-top type formats are the ones suffering the most. So can, you know, maybe Tim or Blair or somebody up there comment on, you know, how that trend might continue to go or, or, or might actually stop? Yeah, I, I'll pounce on that um, to start. Um, I think, again, the medium formerly known as television, right, is basically being stretched horizontally in terms of the device by which you can consume said programming, right? It could be on a tablet, it could be on a phone, it could be on a TV screen, it could be through an, an Xbox, whatever. But it's also being stretched vertically, right? Meaning it's not, it doesn't necessarily need to be consumed live uh, or even on the same day, but through time shifting on demand in the ultimate on demand, which is sort of the all you can eat Netflix kind of subscription thing, right? So I think it's really important to understand when you say ratings are down and the television industry is sort of being compromised and challenged, Yes, under traditional and current definitions, right? Nielsen being effectively the monopolistic arbiter of successful television programs and the advertising that comes along with it. You could make the argument, I have vociferously in the ad business for too long, that Nielsen is only measuring an increasingly smaller amount of what's really going on in total, right? And again, going back to the consumers, ask, ask around. Ask younger audiences, how do they watch? When do they watch? What do they watch? and in what sort of contexts do they watch. And frankly, more and more and more is not sort of in that traditional. And it comes back to my little long or short game, right? Uh, if you want to play the short game, right, selling your content to Netflix for a, you know, a quick buck for a year's worth of windowing, 
That's, that looks good for a quarterly result, right? So if I'm CBS or I'm Fox, I'm in a studio, that's a good, that's a good business. But do I, do I sacrifice three to five years down the road when I might not be able to pull that back, right? And I might not be able to launch my own direct-to-consumer thing because I'm so vested in getting paid by the network operator as well as the advertiser. I, 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 I think it's unsustainable, right? Maybe on the cable side, yes. Broadcasters getting paid twice, I don't think it's sustainable. And again, all it takes, all it takes, is a rethink of the communications and cable portions of the Communications Act to change the rules again, like it was in 92 and 94. I think, I think the conundrum for content companies is, do they go direct to the consumer, which historically they really don't? They go through some auspice, some kind of network operator, some kind of whatever, or do they continue to milk that current cow of that sort of indirect model? And that's the real issue business-wise that every content owner is going through right now, whether they're vertically integrated with a network operator like a Comcast or not, is to direct or not to direct. And, and when? When do we shift that? I, I think the inevitable longer-term forces, as was hinted at before, is, is a more direct model. I would just say that I think um, one of the most difficult questions for investors is at what point in time does the bundle fall apart? And I, I actually take a slightly different view than you. I think it's taking longer and will take longer than people think. But the investor bet is, I mean, we know it's going to end, but is it 20, is it 15, is it 7, is it 3? I don't think that the, I think the content companies are trying to keep the bundles together as much as possible, but one can see, not so much in government policies, but in merger conditions and in some other things down the road, uh, little fissures that then kind of release the dam. And well, when content providers like HBO and others start to really decide that they're going to go over the top, they start to also cause their own fissures, and that's the off point of breaking the, the model and potentially shooting themselves in the foot, and that can get accelerated very quickly. Or create, or, right, or create their own disruption, which may be a better path than having it be foist upon them. And that's always been, and maybe you right. would agree, uh, you know, that's, that's what innovation is all about, and not every company is capable of innovating itself forward. We'll see. All right. On that note, we've uh, exceeded our time here. Thank you all. Very much appreciate your participating today. Thank you.